It's not really that much fun. Oops, I said that on the camera, didn't I? <laughs> uh, okay, we do have a problem. We, we have a problem. <laughs> and the problem is that we're all born with values, and we're all taught values by our, our culture. Uh, and, and these values get in the way when we start looking at the society. When we start looking at another group of individuals, they can be individuals next door. Uh, if you think about when you were in high school, the, the rivals you had in high school, whoever that may happen to have been, I have no idea who, who the rivalries are around here. But uh, if you look at the rivalries that you had, um, there was something wrong with them and there was something right with you guys, right? Who was your school rivalry? What, what school was? Chinley and Window Rock. Chinley, Chinley and Window Rock? Yeah. The same. Oh, was it the same? Chinley and Window Rock? What? Everyone. Everyone? Everyone. Everyone. So everybody, nobody is as good as your school. You have to be true to your school, right? You got the way the world works. That's a value judgment. The reality is the ones, Chinley, Window Rock, what's the difference? I mean, I, they're just down the road from one another. Are the people in Window Rock really that much different than the people in Chinley? How about those guys out in Tuba City? How about the people over in Crown Point? I don't know. <clears throat> How about the kids in Navajo? Are they that much different? All of these are values, and these are values that are taught to us by our, our uh, cultures. Uh, every school has a, has a, uh, has a rival. Um, I went to school in, in, uh, in the Midwest, and my, our rivals were right next door, and they were almost the same. <clears throat> The difference between our two schools, they were Methodist and we were not. We were a non-sectarian school, meaning we didn't have any religious affiliation. So they seemed a lot more strange. They seemed to, uh, to have all these religious precepts that we didn't have. <clears throat> these commonly held values are known as social representations. And we do this. We represent uh, these uh, our, our values versus somebody else's values are there, and they're there all the time, and we, uh, we try to gauge whether our, we are correct and they are wrong. We very rarely think that we're incorrect and they're, they're right, if you think about it. I mean, does it ever happen? <laughs> so when you're in the military, and of course my, my war was Vietnam, <clears throat> when we were looking at the Vietnamese, we were looking at a completely different culture than ours. So here we were, we were taking on another culture. So a lot of the interaction between uh, the U.S. military and the, and the uh, Vietnamese civilians uh, had to do with value judgments. Uh, why, why are they acting this way? We had another problem in Japan. Uh, when, I, when we were stationed in Japan, the Japanese are very polite people. Therefore, they never say no. <laughs> they may mean no, but they never say no. Uh, but as Americans, and we had this problem because we had American GIs over in Japan, and some of these guys were, were flirting with the uh, young Japanese girls. Uh, the last thing in the world the Japanese girls wanted was to, was to date one of the American guys. But if the American guys asked them, they would always say, nay, which means no, but it also means, it, it sounds like maybe, but of course that's not what it, it means at all. Anyway, so the, the, the American GIs uh, uh, got into a lot of trouble. As a matter of fact, they kicked the Marines off of Japan. They are not, we no longer have a, a, new, a Marine base on Japan because they, were, they had so much trouble. We still have two Air Force bases. We still have two Naval bases. But we don't have any Marine bases on Japan. And it was because the Marines got in so much trouble. <clears throat> because for one thing, it was, well, I don't know. The Marines have a different mindset than the rest of the military. And the other problem was they, they wouldn't take no for an answer, and they didn't recognize what no meant in Japanese. Uh, so they had to, they had to move them. Uh, I think our closest base to Japan is Okinawa. Anyway, and these are value judgments. These are social representations. Uh, we, have, uh, we are good, they are bad. That's that kind of thing. Two movements that have, have forced social scientists to acknowledge their social representations have been feminism and Marxism. 
really weird. I read a, I was reading a feminist tract over the weekend, <clears throat> and the, the uh, have you ever heard of the Vagina Diaries? No? Well, that's probably a good thing. They, they really attack men. I read one from the Ukraine, and it's called Field Work and, and Ukrainian Sex. Uh, and it sounds like it's pornographic, but it's not pornographic at all. It doesn't have anything to do with pornography. As a matter of fact, it has to do with attacking men for, for being uh, sexist and uh, abusive, uh, and especially Ukrainian men, evidently. Ukrainian men think they're still living in the 17th century where they have all had total control over females and whatnot. And this lady just excoriates uh, males, uh, but she, it's especially males from the Ukraine, uh, but she also came to the United States and she thinks uh, American men uh, don't handle things very well either. So I'm on chapter 9 out of 15 chapters and right now she's attacking American men. Uh, so one thing, one problem with American men is that we're not as masculine as Ukrainian men. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> Don't ever read the book. It's just, <laughs> it's not the best book in the world. A lot of it, a lot of it is poetry, but uh, she's talking about value judgment. She's talking about her concept of, of what life is supposed to be. Anyway, it's, it's a form of feminism. And because feminism, before feminism, feminism uh, came to the fore in the 19, uh, 1970s, uh, what we refer to as feminism. But there was feminism before that. Remember, women didn't have the vote until 1920. Uh, there was a temperance movement going on in the United States from the 1820s uh, until prohibition was passed. So women have tried to uh, express their... Uh, their, their power and their strength for an extended length of time. This goes way back into the, uh, into the 19th century. Uh, but in the, the 1970s, the feminist movement uh, really broke away from, uh, uh, from society. And at that point, they tried, uh, now was one of the National Organization of Women, uh, uh, became prominent in the United States. They tried to pass the uh, Equal Rights Amendment, and of course, they were unsuccessful. They were uh, they were almost successful, but they were <laughs> were actually unsuccessful. Uh, so this movement has been, uh, and the Me Too movement now is part of this feminist movement in the United States. As curious as that is, somebody attacked the Me Too movement. I'm trying to think who it was. Some famous person attacked them. Some famous female attacked the uh, Me Too movement. I can't think who it was. Anyway, so feminism, fem, feminism is one thing, and then Marxism is the other. Uh, for the longest time, we thought d democracy was the only, I, the only concept, the only, the only positive idea. And capitalism, of course, uh, should be the, should be what everyone does. Uh, but then uh, the Marxist movement started. Marx uh, was alive in the. Uh, middle of the 19th century. He wrote in the middle of the 19th century. He was talking about a revolution taking place. And, and the Mar a Marxist revolution actually did take place in the Soviet Union. I'm sorry, in Russia. Probably the worst place in the world for a Marxist movement to, to take place. Uh, for one thing, it wasn't industrialized. And, uh, Russia was not industrialized at the time. Uh, Marxism has to do with the workers um, taking over the factories uh, has to do with uh, no one being in charge and no one making a lot more money than everybody else. Uh, of course, capitalism has to do with one guy owning everything and he builds the factory and he makes the vast majority of profits and the workers work for whatever small wages they possibly can. A lot of this has to do with immigration in the United States. Uh, one of the things that happened in the United States uh, we, we industrialized, uh, we had all of these industrialists that were building all these huge factories. In order for them to man these factories, they brought in a lot of immigrants. And because they were bringing in immigrants from, uh, who, who had been peasants in, uh, back in Europe, uh, these individuals weren't used to making very much money at all. So they were able to hire them for as cheap wages as they possibly could, which kept the wages low. Well, the profits stayed the same. So some of these industrialists were making money 
by the bucket loaf, they were making a lot more. They were, their profits were huge, were massive. So we had all these robber barons, as we used to refer to them. Well, Marxism uh, is uh, one of those uh, uh, movements that uh, preaches that uh, the workers should take over, <clears throat> should take over production, uh, that uh, capitalists should be discarded. Uh, socialism, and actually uh, throughout most of Europe, uh, they're social democracies. They're not democracies. They're social democracies. Uh, so feminism changed the way we looked at things. Everybody thought before that, uh, of course, if you read the Bible, the Bible tells you that men are in charge and women are subordinate. Kind of, you can argue that point if you like, but uh, uh, men are the ones that make the decisions and women have to do whatever the men say. Men are, are first-class citizens and women are second-class citizens. Uh, but, of course, feminism wants, it seeks equality. Marxism seems to seek equality as well. So this concept of equality uh, became very prominent uh, through Marxism and feminism. And, of course, these two movements started in the 19th century, and, of course, they evolved through uh, the 20th and into the 21st century. So we'll see where it goes uh, from here. But it changed the way that we saw things. Uh, if you remember what was going on in the 19th century, uh, most of the uh, uh, countries in Europe, uh, the premier countries in the world, as it were, uh, uh, were aristocracies. Uh, there were kings and queens and princes and whatnot that were in charge, czars and whatnot. Uh, eventually, of course, all of these, uh, almost all these monarchies were, 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 thrown, were overthrown, uh, except for a handful. Uh, let's see, what countries do still have kings and queens? I guess England still does. Uh, Greece has moved back to a monarchy, uh, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a monarchic democracy of, of sorts. Uh, the, king, queen, the queen doesn't actually run England, she just owns everything. Uh, it's run by parliament, pretty much. Uh, so so the, re, the, the absolute monarch is, it doesn't exist anymore. But of course, at the turn of the 20th century, uh, Germany was a monarchy, Russia was a, was a monarchy, uh, Austria-Hungary was a monarchy, uh, and they were, they were fairly absolute rulers, not really completely as they had been before, but they were still uh, monarchies. And of course, so these two movements, this Marxist and feminist movement, changed things. We're going to talk about value judgments right now, and there is nudity in the next uh, in the next couple slides. So if you don't want to see naked people, then don't look. Would you consider North Korea a monarchy? Uh, it's an, it's he's an absolute ruler, but I wouldn't call it a monarchy. Well, you know, it, it, yeah, it does seem like one, but he doesn't call himself a monarch. Uh, it's uh, it just follows the family line, I guess. Yeah, but it. it yeah, in, in essence, it, it probably is. And he owns everything. He does whatever he wants. He executed his uncle with an anti-aircraft <laughs> weapon. I can't, can't imagine blowing somebody apart with an anti-aircraft gun. It's like hitting somebody with a recoilless rifle. <clears throat> Social scientists in general and psychologists in particular are required to constantly decide what is right or what is normal. And of course, this is the problem as you wander around the world, uh, as they were, they were discovering people around the world, they had to decide uh, what was right and what was wrong. The Spanish came in, and of course, they were very Christian, um, and they were being controlled by the church. Uh, so when they came in and they, and they saw the indigenous peoples of the Americas, they went, oh my goodness, these people are, are, uh, are, not, are incorrect. Uh, they, they go against our religion, uh, there's nudity, there is, uh, uh, they worship the wrong gods. Uh, so we have, to do, we, have to, we have to Christianize them. Uh, the reality is this is all value judgments, and as a psychologist, one of the things I have to do is make value judgments, and unfortunately I have to do that. What's right and what's wrong? Is, something, is somebody mentally healthy or is somebody mentally ill? Uh, we just had another shoot. We had two shootings over the weekend, and they killed five people apiece. As weird as that is, I don't have no idea what the number five has to do with anything. One guy shot his his parent, parents. I think yeah, he shot his parents, 
and then he went to his girlfriend's house, killed his girlfriend, killed his girlfriend's father, and he killed his girlfriend's brother. And they caught it. That was in Louisiana. They just caught him up in Virginia. Killed five people. I don't know where he got that idea. Is that mentally healthy or mentally ill? Is he actually mentally ill? Uh, when he goes to court, we have to decide whether uh, he's mentally healthy, what, whether he's able to, to stand trial or not. Uh, so that's one of the value judgments that we have to make. Is somebody uh, well adjusted or poorly adjusted? Uh, we have these conversations all the time. Uh, if somebody's OCD, uh, when are they well adjusted? Where, when are they poorly adjusted? Does this destroy their life? Does, is this uh, 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 hurting things? Uh, if we have a 30 year old uh, individual that's living at, at their parents' house, are they immature or are they mature? Is this something that's normal? Or is, if they're being taken care of by their by their mother, is this uh, is this normal or not normal? They're in their 30s and and they're not uh, they're not out of the house yet. And a lot of times it has to do with the culture. Uh, one of the problems they're having in Italy right now is they can't they can't get the, the, the males to move out of the house. Um, the other problem is they're not their uh, birth uh, birth rate is. <coughs> is uh, they're not sustaining themselves. This is a really serious problem because they're, they're not making enough people to s support the country. They don't have any workers. Men and women aren't making babies anymore. The men don't want to move out of the house. Mom wants them to stay in the house and she will give them anything that they want as long as they stay in the house. She doesn't want to give her baby away to some woman who will ruin him. So she keeps him until she gets so old that she can't take care of herself anymore. Finally, she passes away, and now he's in his 50s or 60s. What's the probability he's going to become a father? They're not very high. So, the, and the women are wandering around, going, "I have nobody to marry." You know, all the all the eligible bachelors live with their mothers, and their mothers don't want them to date anybody. They do, of course. They become playboys. But they're not making babies anymore in, uh, in Italy. It's the strangest thing. It's a Catholic country. And of course, you would think that they would try to make as many babies as they possibly could, but that's not the way it works. Isn't that strange? Or not? I don't know. <laughs> uh, so they have a lot of immigrants in Italy. Now the weird part is that uh, if you went to Germany after World War II, a lot of uh, Italians were moving to Germany to work because there was no work in Italy. So they have a lot of immigrant Italians in Germany who have been there for three to four generations. And they're still not, they're still not citizens of, the, of Germany because Germany won't, doesn't allow you to be, you have to be born in Germany to be a citizen for one thing. And if you claim uh, citizenship from another country, they won't let you change. You, you can marry. If you marry a German, then you can become a, a German citizen. So we have Americans that go over there as military personnel. And uh, they'll marry a German and then they'll stay. But unless they marry a German, they can't, they can't stay in Germany. As weird as that is. Anyway, value judgments, mature and immature. So is that, what do you think? You've got all these playboys in, in Italy. Is that mature or immature? <clears throat> They've got, a, they've got a pretty damn good deal. They get to save all their money. They buy really nice cars. They really, they have not nice. Uh, they eat very well. Their parents mostly feed them. They buy the wine. And of course, it's very expensive bottles of wine. What do you think? Is that mature or immature? They live with their mothers. Into their 40s and 50s. And then they never get married, and they never make a family. Is that mature or immature? <laughs> Sounds like a good time, doesn't it? You got somebody taking care of you. You get to be a kid all your life. Your mom knows how you like your, your clothes washed. Or she puts the right amount of starch in it. She puts the right smelly stuff in it. I don't know. I think that's an absurd. You think it's immature? Okay. 
if it was the other way around and it was only the woman that was staying and doing all this, then it would be a different story currently. Then they would say that the lady's lazy and she doesn't want to do anything. If it's a guy, apparently it's okay. It's so it depends guy. on the gender. Okay. And the culture. And yeah. it's the Italian culture. Yeah. It's the Italian mothers. Italian mothers <laughs> come up and just smack you right in the face. <laughs> They want their, their little boys to stay at home. If they let their little boys go out and just impregnate anybody that they want, these, you know, these tainted women, allowing these tainted women to ruin their little boys, isn't this better than being ruined by a questionable female? For the longest time, women have stayed home until they got married. Okay. If you watch any of the old movies, I was well, Brigadoon. I was watching Brigadoon this weekend. Uh, my wife was there. She loves Gene Kelly. I know she was. She loves Gene Kelly. Okay. So when Gene Kelly's on television, I don't exist. All right. I and I know that, and I recognize that, and I accept it. As sad as that is. <laughs> So Gene Kelly was on television when we watched Brigadoon. Well, what's Brigadoon about? It's about a family of, of young females, and the oldest sister, uh, the oldest sister is not married, but one of the younger sisters is getting married. That's the whole premise of Brigadoon. And then Gene Kelly comes along and uh, meets the older sister, falls in love with her. Uh, but there's has to do with magic and witches and all kinds of weird things. But the whole idea is that uh, as, the, as the maiden <coughs> aunt or as the, uh, uh, the older sister, she will stay home and take care of the of mother, mother and father and, and everything else. And when somebody has a baby, guess who gets to go over and help take care of the baby? She does, of course. This is the whole maiden aunt thing. Okay. Well, and that's, that's relatively common and has been relatively common. In, in this culture, not your culture, but the, the American culture for an extended length of time. And sometimes they would go and they would help with the baby for, you know, a year, year and a half. And of course, it's nice to have somebody to help take care of the baby when the baby's first born. Anyway, I don't know. Mature, immature. I know, these are all value judgments. So the culture, the, the Italian culture, where the mother wants the, her son to stay home so he doesn't become tainted by any of these floozies, I mean, that's one thing, is that it mature or immature? Well, that's one way to look at it, but what about the American culture where the, uh, the, the older sister was, was thought to, uh, needed to stay home so that she could take care of the parents as the parents got older? Uh, these are sculptures, and these are sculptures of people without any clothes on. Uh, two of them are women and one of them is a guy. This is... Uh, Michelangelo's famous David. Uh, it's in Florence, I think. And this is a sculpture. Here's a naked woman, naked woman. Here's a naked guy. Here's a naked guy. Uh, this is at um, the Justice Department. And of course, that's, she's supposed to be justice. Why she doesn't have anything on top of her, I'm not exactly sure. Sometimes they drape a tunic down, down her front, but not in this picture. Are not in this sculpture. She's just right there, just standing there with her hands up. Touchdown! <laughs> Field goal. It's good. Okay. I don't know. Oh, it was made before football was football. So <laughs> <laughs> she's not saying anything about about uh, about football. <clears throat> uh, acceptable or unacceptable? What do you think? Is this nudity? Is this pornography? No. It's art. It's art, so it's okay. <clears throat> I think it's all in the context. Ah, so <clears throat> these are sculptures. These are sculptures about something, I guess. So context. You say no, no, it's art. Does anybody see this as obscene? <clears throat> okay. If it were to be in the United States, then yeah, it would be. I think it would be. For for children, probably. Really. <clears throat> In the United States. My daughter was sitting yeah. here. She was, I wouldn't want her to. To see naked yeah. boys and girls. I think Larry Flint went to court over that in the seventies. Uh, he went to court over his over. <laughs> his oh, some, several things. Yeah, yeah, yeah but I don't think it was it had anything to do with. But it was a, a First Amendment argument. 
It, that is true. And uh, we have had, uh, there have been people around the world who uh, would cover this up. They would cover up his, uh, his uh, genitalia with uh, fig leaves. And of course, there were popes that, that found the naked body to be obscene, and they would chop off the genitalia, well, the male genitalia, and cover it with fig leaves. So if, you, if you've ever watched the movie uh, Inferno, He's walking through uh, one of the art galleries in the, uh, in the Vatican, and uh, of course they've all got fig leaves on it. And he uh, complains about the vandalism of the, of the sculptures. I think it also depends on the audience. Um, okay. Not so much like conservative or liberal or, or artistic, but the age of the audience <coughs> also. Uh, I, I think there's some things that are appropriate for a uh, 21 year old. A 13 year old, a 7 year old, you know, that are, there's a sliding scale. Some things that are inappropriate for that, along that scale. I, I think, uh, if you've got a 3 year old, what do they, what do they know about nudity? I think they, they know some because they cover up. I don't know. I've had, <laughs> I can remember T ball where the kid <laughs> turned around and just urinated all over the, the home plate just before he got to bed. That was a little surprising. Uh, so sometimes they just, they don't have a clue. You know, nudity doesn't mean anything. It's not, yeah, okay. I think if my little sister were here, because um, I don't try and sugarcoat things with her, right. but neither does my dad or my mom. If she wants to know something, you tell her, because then she'll know. Yeah. So if she would say, like, Shai, like, how come you're naked? And I would say, like, well, because the artist or whoever sculpted it said <clears throat> this. Right. So whatever that person did or whatever, I would tell her what they thought about it. The question is, who decides if this is good or bad? If you call it art, then it's okay, right? Mm -hmm. That they're naked, if we refer to it as art. Mm -hmm. If we refer to it as pornographic, we see it as pornographic, then it is pornographic. I, again, it depends on the context. So it has to do with your value judgment. That's the whole point. There's a, I think there's a sliding I Me, personally, I think there's a sliding scale. Like okay. uh, a woman's breast, I think, to my six-year-old child would not be pornographic. Still breastfeeding. Sure. Uh, watching Cinemax at 11 o'clock at night, I wouldn't let my seven-year-old son do that. That's naked bodies again, you know, that's... But is it also intercourse? Are we talking about sexual intercourse? It could be just even, not even intercourse, if, if just a woman's body being displayed in a certain manner, the context in okay. which. And then when we go to ceremonies, and uh, sometimes when a female or a male has to sit on the um, sand painting, they have to take their shirt off. And, and that's not pornographic. I allow right. my seven-year-old son to see that, my children to see okay. that. So again, it depends on the context, I think, the way it's presented. Let me show you the next picture. You ready? <laughs> These are the Karubo of the Amazon rainforest. Uh, Amazon uh, rainforest, of course, is along the uh, uh, equator. So it's hot, hot. And if you've ever, ever been in a rainforest, of course, probably you've never been in a rainforest, but it's really humid. Uh, so clothes seem very constricting. Uh, these individuals never wear clothes throughout their entire lives. And they're an isolated tribe. So, we're talking about context here. What about here? Maybe there's a difference between religion and what is art. I think it has to <clears throat> depend on the education. Because America's really sensitive to everything as to people around the world are like, there's a lot of new beaches because they're True. they're they're teaching their kids it's okay you're but you know don't touch if they don't want to be touched well stuff like that there's rules like that but in America they're like oh there's a naked person don't look at it that's America like don't even look at a naked lady naked man nothing so I think it has to do something with the education okay so sensitive <laughs> yeah that's what I heard anyway. okay I think. Um there's a difference between laws in these different countries? Right. You're right. Uh, when I was in Germany, uh, nude swimming at the Swimbad. It's the 
people go there to take a shower. <laughs> Germans don't like to use. They don't like to spend money. They're kind of cheap. Uh, so they, they go to public places to take a shower. <clears throat> uh, nude swimming at the swim bot. So, you know, if you go to the swim bot on Thursday nights, you're going to see a lot of naked people. It's just they don't, they don't wear bathing suits. And of course, the next day is Friday, so they need to take a shower because they've been working all week and they may have an, an odor about them. Uh, Japan, they have uh, uh, communal baths where the males swim over here, the females swim over there. And then they've got a family section where families swim together. And that's totally acceptable. Uh, it's totally acceptable in Japan for, uh, let me tell you a quick story. I was watching a, a Buddhist um, uh, a parade. Uh, it was some kind of a Buddhist festival. It was a parade. And they were, uh, they don't, nothing was mechanized. The, uh, the idea was nothing was supposed to be mechanized in this whole thing. So anything that moved, there was somebody in there moving it. Uh, so they had these, these huge uh, uh, displays and they were being pulled by humans, of course, and there were maybe 10 or 15 of them, and they all had a rope, and they were all pulling on their, their, uh, uh, these displays. Uh, it's hot. It was hot that day. And of course, this is northern Japan, uh, so it, it was hot, so they pulled down their kimonos. Well, it was, there was both male and female there, and they, and they all pulled down their kimonos, and they didn't think anything about it walking along. I don't know if you've ever seen the Japanese, but they've got a, uh, they, they wear this thing around their, their uh, genitalia that looks like a jock strap, but it's not really. It look, if, you've, if you've ever seen a sumo wrestler, he wears one of these things. Well, in, in the old days, everybody wore one of those things. And of course, this was a Buddhist uh, uh, parade, so everybody was wearing, well, the females, I don't know what the females were wearing down there. But sometimes the males just took their kimonos off and they just had these things on. And the women, of course, were, were burying themselves, uh, their tops in the way. They, uh, and I was a bit surprised. I was a bit shocked. Because I'm an American, and we don't normally see people walking down the street without any top on. We don't see women walking down the, the street with their, their top on. But this is Japan, and Japan has different... It's a different culture, completely. And it's a different religion. Uh, so a lot of, of our decisions, just like you said, it has to do with, uh, we're in the United States. So Christianity has, it dictates to us what is right and what is wrong, what seems to have in the past. In Japan, they're Buddhists, so, and Shinto, so they're different. Uh, in Korea, they were primarily, they were primarily uh, Christian, strangely enough, in Korea, despite the fact that Korea was controlled by the Japanese, since 19, from 1919 until 1945, but they're, but they're primarily Christian as well. So you wouldn't see this in Korea, but you saw this in Japan. Uh, when you watched advertisements on television, sometimes they would, they would show a bare-chested woman. Um, yeah, it was just their culture. It was just the way it was. Germany was the same way. In, in uh, Holland, in the Netherlands, uh, after 10 o'clock, uh, they had pornography on television. They did that when I was over there anyway, which I thought was a little odd, a little different. Not in Germany, but in, in uh, Holland, that was the way it was. Anyway, so do you see this as obscene? Because these people don't wear clothes. Is it okay? Not in this context, no. You mean if they came here? Well, it's, <clears throat> it's only 15 degrees outside. I don't think they're, gonna be, they're probably going to put something on. <laughs> But it's hot down there. It's really hot. Uh, when, when I served in Vietnam, it was, geez, it was so steamy over there. Yeah, I wanted to take my clothes off. And some, some guys stripped down to their, their t-shirts. Of course, this is in the military. And you're not allowed to be out of uniform. So you sweat a lot. And sometimes you got in trouble. Okay, so art, that has to do with their culture. So that's okay. The question, and, and here's, here's my last picture. A uh, famous picture of Miley Cyrus. Of course, she's married to one of the Hemsworths now, and I think she, she's dyed her hair brown, or she's allowed it to go back to brown. Is this obscene or is this not obscene? This is a very famous picture, or a very famous, I don't remember. I didn't see the video. It's kind of a double standard, I think, or I think it's 
Spirit. It seemed to have been acceptable at the time. Well, before she did it, there's a lot of, like a lot of other artists that did almost the exact same thing, but it's just that she went the like the wrecking ball. Not the wrecking ball, like oh. just being naked oh. in general. And they did it for covers, for their album covers, okay. and everything. Nobody said anything. Okay. But when it was her, everybody just blew up about it. You know, I think it's this tattoo she's got up here. <laughs> 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 I have no idea. Her boots are ugly. Those are those look like plastic boots. Or something. I think people just had a problem with her. It wasn't the nudity, or whatever. Uh, it was just a problem with her, and I don't think they should have brought it in. You think it had to do with the fact that she was Hannah Montana, one of the Disney children? Oh, like she was on TV for kids, right? And, everything. and then this was right after she turned, I don't know, eighteen or nineteen. After she became legal. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Weird, isn't it? So many of the Disney kids just go bad after after they become adults. <laughs> Lindsay Lohan was a Disney kid. <laughs> hmm. I don't know. Write that down, Disney kid. <laughs> anyway, okay. So these are all value judge judgments. You can see this is obscene if you like. You can see that as obscene if you like. You can see that as obscene as you like. But it's all a value judgment. Uh, and we can do this with, we, can, we have value judgments about a lot of different things. Uh, the, the peyote. Uh, there, are people, there are people in the United States who are very anti-drug. And these, these individuals uh, think that uh, the Native American church shouldn't use peyote because it's a drug. And they have all these negative ideas about things. Value ju judgment. Once again, it's a value judgment. Religion is a value judgment. Whether you're, you're a Christian or a not, not a Christian, whether you're a Buddhist or a Muslim, it really doesn't make any difference. The, the, your religion tells you how the world is supposed to be. And when they tell you what it's supposed to be, that's a value judgment. They're giving you your value judgments. They're giving you your values. As painful as that is. I'll get off the nudity thing. Okay. <laughs> One reason why any psychological theory should be approached with a degree of skepticism is because the theory was developed utilizing a select scientist value judgment. And you have to understand who they are. This is one of the reasons why when I talk about Freud or I talk about Erickson or I talk about Jung, I tell you who they were and where they came from. Because I want you to understand what their value judgment was. This is Abraham Maslow. <clears throat> Maslow came up with the hierarchy of needs. We still use the hierarchy of needs. Where did he come up with the hierarchy of needs? Who was Abraham Maslow? Abraham Maslow was a Jewish gentleman from New York City, and he was uh, he was a militant Jewish person. Uh, he grew up in the time where there was no Israel, uh, but he wanted there to be he wanted the, the Jewish people to have a homeland because this was in the uh, 1920s and 1930s. And in the 1930s, of course, in 1932, Hitler became the uh, prime minister of, uh, of Germany. And after that, he started persecuting the Jews. The Russians had always persecuted the Jews. They had always given them a hard time. The Germans had always given them a hard time. The French had always given them a hard time. So there was no country in the world where they could go to be free. Not even in the United States, because one of the movements in the United States at this time was the, were the Ku Klux Klan. The Ku Klux Klan were marching in, in uh, Washington, D.C. The Ku Klux Klan didn't like uh, people who were not Protestant Christian. They didn't like Catholics. They didn't like Jewish people. So you couldn't even go to the United States. It's probably the freest place, the best place you could go in the world because you're less likely to be persecuted. You're less likely to be executed uh, for being Jewish. But that's Ab Abraham Maslow. He became what they refer to as a Zionist. He was trying to create a Jewish homeland. And the Zionists uh, tried to uh, smuggle people into Palestine because they thought Palestine, Palestine was the a historical uh, home of, of the Jewish people. If you read the Bible, the Old Testament talks about it talks about uh, about Israel. It talks about uh, that area of the, of the country being Jewish, and so the Zionists wanted to move move all the non-Jewish people out of that area 
and allow the Jewish people to, uh, to control that area once again. And this was known as Zionism. Lots of arguments around the world. Some people said, yeah, geez, how, what are we going to do about the Jewish problem? And other individuals are saying, I know, why don't we just give them a homeland? But, but this really didn't come up until after World War II, after, after they uh, exterminated uh, millions of Jewish people in Europe. Uh, but Abraham Maslow was a, was a Zionist. Now, one of the interesting things that happened during World War II uh, was that uh, Jewish people were trying to flee. Uh, they were trying to flee in Europe because the, the Nazis were were uh, were imprisoning them. They didn't at this point. They didn't know that they were exterminating them uh, on on mass like they did. Uh, but uh, so there were there were Jewish people trying to, to to immigrate into other countries, Mexico, South America. Nobody let them in. Even the United States wouldn't let them in. Uh, but the United States is very selective. Some people they allowed to come in. They allowed doctors to come in. They allowed musicians to come in. They allowed uh, very important people with uh, uh, who could potentially help them. They let Einstein come in. It's not nice of us to have allowed Einstein to come in. We let the scientists come in. We didn't let uh, we didn't let uh, them come in on Mars. Uh, so um, Maslow at this time was was an 18 or 19 year old in uh, New York City, uh, and uh, he was part of the Zionist movement. And because of that, he was able to meet all of these people coming into uh, coming into the United States. He spoke Yiddish. Yiddish is a cross between Hebrew, German, and uh, Russian, uh, and he spoke Yiddish. So he was one of the individuals that interviewed all of these individuals. And of course, then he, was go he went to college. Uh, he actually smuggled people into Palestine when he was 17 years old. He actually did that. So he was one of these individuals. So the heroes that he talked about when he was trying to define uh, who, uh, his hierarchy of needs, trying to create his hierarchy of needs, they were all Jewish people fleeing a year. And that's where he came up with his hierarchy of needs. So this whole concept of becoming uh, self-actualized, uh, these were the, the musicians, these were the scientists, these were these, uh, these individuals who were highly accomplished individuals. And of course their accomplishments, because they were Jewish, were denigrated in Germany and Russia and wherever they were. So they came to the United States and at that point they were able to flower, they were able to self-actualize. So if we, when we look at his hierarchy of needs, what we're really looking at is people who had been uh, who had been denigrated and persecuted, uh, and they all they and they needed to survive. So he knew uh, what you needed in order to become a successful individual. And eventually, of course, if you're given enough, if you're given uh, given enough food, you're given some place to live, uh, you're allowed to work someplace. Then, of course, you, eventually you can become self-actualized. But he was a Zionist, as interesting as that is. There's nothing wrong with Zionists, but of course, I mean, if you look at the internet, of course, they they will argue that Zionism is a is a uh, something negative. What are they? The elders of Zion. They've got this. It's, I don't even think about it. It's, it has to do with political science, as strange as that is. Okay. So value judgments, and of course we do value judgments all the time. Let me give you an example. This is nationalism versus patriotism. Moafik is from Afghanistan and wants to prevent the United States from destroying his country. He considers himself patriotic because he doesn't want the United States to destroy his country. Kyle's from Pittsburgh, that's the guy on the top, and not only backs the United States invasion as patriotic, but sees Moafik's position as blindly nationalistic. Kyle sees the invasion of Afghanistan as a patriotic endeavor to keep terrorists out of the United States. So if we're looking at it from Moafiq's point of view, he's, he's a patriot. He's an Afghan patriot. But if we look at it from Kyle's point of view, he sees Moafiq as a nationalist. <clears throat> and he, he thinks that uh, the invasion of Afghanistan was, was okay. Because... He's a, he's a patriotic American, not a patriotic Afghan. Let me give you another example. Open-ended marriages versus adultery. When Jocko married Simone, 
he told her uh, from the start that he was not sure if he could stick with the monogamy thing. Three years into the marriage, he came home early to find his wife having an affair with his bald next door neighbor. Uh, he accused her of adultery and defended his own indiscretions as an agreed upon, open-ended marriage. So as far as he was concerned, he could have all the sex with anybody else that he wanted. That was because it was an open-ended marriage. But of course, when she, when she did the same thing that he did, then it became adultery. Value judgment. From her point of view, if he can do it, I can do it. From his point of view, I can do it, but you can't because that, then it's adultery. Ambitious versus aggressive, we see this all the time with male and female leaders. Uh, Marlene and Marlon uh, were after the same pr promotion at work. Uh, both put in extra hours and put in a great deal of overtime. Uh, while both demanded a great deal from their workers, Marlene was branded as aggressive, while Marlon was seen as ambitious. No one wanted to work for an aggressive female, but they didn't mind working for an ambitious male. And of course, uh, the argument uh, going on between Nancy Pelosi and Donald Trump right now, uh, some people see her as a, uh, as a pushy bitch, uh, but other, you know, why is she a pushy bitch? <laughs> so why, why do we allow Donald Trump to do the, exactly the same thing and we don't call him? Anything negative. Well, they call them all kinds of negative and things. Why? No, I, I, I call them all <laughs> kinds of negative things myself. Anyway, but uh, there are a lot of individuals that don't want to see a female doing the same thing males do. If a female does the same thing that a male does, they see it as more negative than, than when the male does it. Let me give you another example. Timid versus cautious. Uh, Daryl and Daryl uh, went to the same school and were in the same grade. Both were seen as shy when they were young. Uh, when they entered high school, Daryl was teased mercilessly as being cautious, while Daryl was seen as demure and ladylike for her timidity. So it has to do with value judgment. Because she was female, it's okay for her to be shy. Uh, when the male was shy, of course, this isn't a normal male characteristic, therefore they saw him as cautious. Negative and negative. Ah. This is something to, to remember. Perversions are sex acts that we do not practice. So what's perverted? What's obscene? What is pornography? Pornography is something that we don't want to see. That's all it is. Uh, it's like in Germany. If you don't want to see naked people, don't go swimming on Thursday night because every, nobody wears bathing suits on Thursday night. Is it porn pornographic? No. Really? Is it, is, it, is it obscene? Well, no. Just stay out of the swim bod, the, the swimming pool on Thursday nights. So a per perversion is any sex act that you don't practice. Uh, this has something to do with 30 shades of gray, but I've never read the book, so I'm not exactly sure what's going on. Uh, for a period of time, the Clinton-Lewinsky affair rocked the foundations of the United States government. He was impeached because he lied about having this affair with Monica Lewinsky. Actually, he lied about a couple other things as well. Portions of the populace were appalled by the perversions that the two participated in. The myriad of jokes showed the idea of normal. So what was the difference between, uh, between uh, uh, with him having an affair? I mean, other people had affairs. As a matter of fact, that's one of the reasons why it wasn't impeached. The guy that brought uh, uh, the suit against him, uh, Newt Gingrich, was the Speaker of the House at the time. He was having an affair at that time. <laughs> What's the difference between the president's uh, affair and Newt Gingrich's affair? And of course, then they had to get rid of Newt Gingrich because uh, he couldn't prosecute. Uh, so they brought another guy in. It turned out he was having an did affair. Did he quit? I thought Newt Gingrich quit. He did. He quit. He didn't get rid of him. He stepped down. Yeah, he stepped down because he couldn't. He couldn't do the impeachment. I mean, it seemed fairly hypocritical for him to do that. So then they brought in another guy, it turned out that he was having an affair, so he had to step down. And then the guy from uh, Illinois, the, rest, the wrestling coach, came in. Turned out the wrestling coach had been, had, had an affair with, with some of his wrestlers. So, but that was later on, we didn't find out about that until later. So we got a problem with our poli politicians. Our politicians are not uh, saints, obviously. And, um, and Donald Trump obviously is not a saint either. But uh, really kind of interesting, value judgments. One side, side sees things as negative, the other side, side sees things as positive. 
<clears throat> Social science may uh, many times will get caught uh, between what is and what the scientist believes ought to be. This is known as a naturalistic fallacy. And that's what happened uh, when the Europeans first came over here, of course. They saw you guys as one thing. They saw you as non-Christian. They didn't like that. Uh, so they tried to change it. They tried to change uh, what was to what ought to be, what they thought was uh, should be. Uh, this is uh, very uh, obvious if you go to Hawaii. Uh, Hawaii is a... Is a uh, I, I, has anybody ever been to Hawaii? It's nice there, isn't it? I mean, like, every damn day. It's like 85 degrees. And gets down to 60 at night. You don't have to wear clothes. It's that nice, but I'm sure you wear clothes. I wear shoes, at least. And you wore shoes. <laughs> okay, there you go. As long as you wear shoes, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> when the missionaries first went there, people didn't wear very many clothes, or if they wore any at all. And they're wandering around naked all the time. They did this really strange dance where they moved their hips a lot, called the hula, and they thought it was lascivious. They thought it was an obscene dance. So when the missionaries came in, they put clothes on these people. They took, took away their grass skirts. Uh, of course, they weren't wearing anything on top except the lace, and this is the way they dressed them. They dressed them so that they wouldn't they wouldn't offend the missionaries. They didn't want, the missionaries didn't want them to offend themselves, uh, them. Uh, so they changed the way they were. And of course, that's a naturalistic fallacy. Not allowing the people to be whatever they, whatever they want to be. And of course, we saw these pictures back here, if I can make it go backwards. Come on, you go, okay, yeah. So, <clears throat> is this okay for these people to be naked like this? Does anybody not, not think it's okay for these people to wear whatever the hell they want to wear? Not in their own homeland. Wherever they want to be, yeah. In New Guinea, the people don't wear clothes. It's, it's along the equator as well. And there are a lot of individuals that just don't wear any clothes. But when they go into town, when they go to see the doctor, they have to wear what they call a modesty belt that covers their genitalia. As interesting as that is, we we'll get away from Miley Cyrus and her wrecking ball. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, so which is, which is right? The, the one on the left or the one on the right? As Americans, when we look at, uh, at this and we think that that's repressive. But there, that's the way they dress in some of the Arab countries. They see this as obscene. We see this as natural. We see this as okay. I don't think anybody's gonna come to school in a burqa tomorrow. I hope not. Seems kind of, <laughs> you barely see anything. <clears throat> so how do you know what this lady looks like? Well, not, not that it's any of, your, any of our business what she looks like. Uh, a lot of men fall in love with their eyes. As weird as that, since that's a point. Okay. <laughs> they even wear gloves. They fall in love with their eyes. <clears throat> as strange as that is. But isn't that better though? At least they're not saying, oh, you're pretty. That means like, you're good enough for me. At least they like their personality or something like that, right? No, they don't even get to talk to them. When I was in Iraq, they were all the Yes. You meet your wife until the wedding. Yeah. The first, the first time you see any any part of her is her hand, and she's got it all painted up with uh, or her ankles. Yeah, yeah. Aren't Native Americans like that too? Especially now, because there's still arranged marriages and everything. Isn't that the same thing? How many people were have, have an arranged marriage? Anybody? My aunt was an arranged marriage, and she hated the guys, so, but they got married. Okay. So, yeah. That's one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you guys do arranged marriages that frequently anymore. But, but in the old days, maybe. I think the last sure. generation was the last one to do it. My, I had a couple of my aunts that got married to arranged marriages. Too. But they were uh, families with oh. connecting ties. Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. But so, that was normal. Yeah, that was normal. It was normal. So society dictates to you how, how you're going to do things. I think boarding schools and uh, like the kids being plucked out from the home, right? And then eventually schools like junior state schools and some other kids their social changed the entire social structure of nowadays. And then people start dating because before there was no boyfriend girlfriends. 
now everybody has a boyfriend or a girlfriend in high school or a crush and got westernized and so we lost that. High school? You're talking about junior high. Yeah. You're talking about elementary school. So <laughs> I, that's why I think our, our last generation was the last one to really uh, be traditional. Or they call it friend. <laughs> now it's friends, yeah. <laughs> what <do you> mean? <laughs> <You're a generation. laughs> Why don't you have any friends? Uh, well, friends. That's, uh... <laughs> <laughs> my friend came and visited me this week. <laughs> that's what my mom says. My, my wife came. Well, that's your husband. You're like in bed with him. No, it's because there was no such thing as boyfriend girlfriend in the last generation. I guess it did come from the prior generation, yeah, because there was no such thing as, this is my boyfriend. Bring it back. Your first. <laughs> Bring it back. <laughs> I volunteer <to> Emery. <laughs> what's a, what's upon a point? For you. <laughs> well, the boarding school, they, they really broke up a lot of stuff. It broke up the tribes, for one thing. It, it kind of broke them up. Uh, not only that, but um, a lot of individuals, this is the first time they'd ever seen anybody from another tribe. Uh, so there was a lot of intertribal marriages taking place that, I mean, you wouldn't see. I have a friend from Montana that married a lady from Tuma <clears throat> City. Didn't work out, but, um, you know, he would never have met her if it hadn't been for boarding school. I don't know if that's good or bad. I guess it's bad as far as he was concerned. They didn't stay together very long, but he's the 30-year-old that was being taken care of by his mother. <laughs> we talked about that too. <laughs> it seems like arranged marriages last longer than when you pick your own spouse. A lot of times it's because the laws state that you can't, you have to stay together. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Well, that goes with the Well, I think, I think what it comes down to is because when you have one family that is very traditional, they probably raise the child in that type of a home. Mm -hmm. And so when they approach another family that has traditional raised their child in that type of environment, they have a lot more in common mm -hmm. rather than just meeting someone and then right. getting to know their, that you're, over the next five years that you're not a match. Mm -hmm. and so that's why I think a lot of arranged marriages lasted long because they already had so much in common mm -hmm. and the parents knew that coming together. Because you, obviously if someone was raised tr strictly Christian, Navajo over here and the Navajo family approached them for a range wedding, they, would, they wouldn't do it. Right. The families wouldn't agree on it. Right. So usually it was amongst like-minded individuals, so they always had a lot of the same value systems already right off the bat. Um, <clears throat> they had a lot of things that matched up already. That when you pick someone from that you met at school or over the internet or wherever, you spend the next five, six years finding out that you're not a match. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Or you guys don't have the same or you find values. Yeah, or the same values or same religion. Yeah, because when I think back to my great Nolly, they been married. They were married for like seventy years. And I was just like, and here I got my first marriage only lasts like two years. And I was just like, <laughs> how'd you guys do it? Like, but now I'm on my second marriage, and I mean, it's going good. <laughs> But it wasn't, a, neither were arranged marriages. No. Neither of your marriages were arranged marriages. No. But your great knowledge, she, they were, that was an arranged marriage. Mm -hmm. It lasted for 70 years. Mm -hmm. The only recent arranged marriage I heard or attempted was my boyfriend when we were dating yet, when he was in eighth grade. They, some other family came to his grandma and they asked if um, their grandson could marry into their family. There's something going to be exchanged. I don't, he didn't really tell me what. It was either part of their land or something. But they asked, you know, my boyfriend, and they're right. like, he, he said no because he didn't know the person. So, but he was only in eighth grade at the time, though. So that was the only time I've heard of a, an arranged marriage other than my aunt. There was an employee who got married here through an arranged marriage. Oh. Uh, she's a former Miss Navajo, uh, oh. Jonathan So. I don't know if you know her. Uh, she probably was probably here before we left yeah. before you got here, but um, three years ago, we've been here for three. Years. Her boyfriend, <clears throat> or I guess, excuse me, her husband and his family went to her family, and they approached and they asked to marry the family. They knew each other, right? But they weren't dating or anything. Right. They told his family I want to marry that girl, so we went over. We actually still together. Oh wow! 
I would be scared, like someone's family came, like, I want you to say, no! <laughs> I will. It sounds like a song. But that's the, the, most, that's the most recent one and the last one I've ever heard. So, I, maybe things are changing. I don't know. Well, we should bring it back. To <laughs> See what happens. Try it. ArrangedMarriagesOnly.com. <laughs> <laughs> you register your family. <laughs> You've got a daughter. Go ahead and find her. <laughs> they have to come to me first. Oh, they have to come to you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> the self is shaped by and shapes the social environment, your social environment. Um, the self is our social being that has the ability to use symbols to communicate with itself through self-awareness. Self-awareness and symbol usage may have evolved as a means to deal with an increasingly complex social environment. I told you that I was reading a book. Um, those are all symbols. All those letters are symbols. Now, the strange thing is, and this is the weird part, it's a book that was written in Ukrainian. Uh, the lady is Ukrainian, and the, U the Ukraine was part of uh, the Soviet Union for an extended length of time. So the book sounds like it's Russian. The Russians use a lot of poetry. The Russians use a lot of, of allusions. So reading the book is, she, she says, the, the black crow flew across the sky like threads of a, of a, of, you know, of a knitting thing, a sweater that's coming apart. You know, all, all kinds of really weird symbols. Uh, so, but, so it's different. But her, her environment uh, is, is completely different from mine, and that's what I'm trying to understand. I'm trying to understand uh, the Ukrainian environment. Self-awareness allows people to reflect on their own actions as a means of, uh, to understand what others might do. Communication allows people to coordinate their activities. And of course, she's communicating with me. I don't understand the Ukraine. <clears throat> right now there's an argument, there's a war going on in the Ukraine. Russia is backing the Ukrainian separatists. Um, the rest of the world seems to be backing the Ukrainian government. The Ukrainian government was a mess uh, and it it, it collapsed, and at that point, Russia started to step in. The Ukraine used to control Crimea. The Russians took over Crimea. So there's a lot of arguments going on right now around the world. Uh, one, one of the questions was, what would we do? And the answer is, well, Donald Trump became the president, and Trump likes the Russians, or at least he won't say anything negative about anything that the Russians do. So he didn't say anything. He just allowed them to do whatever they wanted. They seized Crimea. He said no. Uh, they're, they're backing the war with the Ukrainian separatists. He says nothing. So this is, is really kind of interesting. Uh, but the, the whole point is that uh, we uh, understand our, envir our environment through the communication that we, that we do. The self-serving uh, bias, the tendency to take credit for success but deny responsibility for failure, affects our self-concepts and therefore affects the way that we respond, the way we respond to social events. We use it to protect our sense of self-worth. Wow, this whole self-serving bias. So I never do anything wrong, it's always somebody else. What happened? Oh, I was, uh, I was almost in a wreck uh, driving down to Albuquerque to pick up my wife. I know. <laughs> 40. You know, right there at the Casino 66, Route 66 Casino, I think it's, I think Laguna, the Laguna guys own that. And then right across the street, there's a gas station with Laguna burgers. Anyway, that's where the, the wreck was. It was right up the hill. Right when it starts to turn into a, a three-lane highway, you know, a three-lane. Going into Albuquerque. Yeah, going into Albuquerque. And of course, that's the only way you can get into Albuquerque. I didn't realize that. So they're trying to reroute us, and they took us up the access road uh, that goes right beside the highway. There's one on each side. But one side was they were using for emergency vehicles. So they had two lines of traffic moving on this two-lane highway that had some, it was uh, <coughs> supposed to service uh, five lanes in here. They'd stopped us for an hour and a half. It was a mess. It was a huge. So just went around Berlin. Uh, backed up. Right? I don't know. We where, where did. You know the love station, the love uh, gas station? That's where we got back on the highway. It was right there. I mean, we drove all the way from down, from the bottom of the hill all the way to, to, to that love station, which is right on top of the hill going down into Albuquerque. So it was about, I don't know, five or ten miles. It was a long way. 
And then the accident was right there. I was only about three minutes behind it. So I was right behind it. I was literally right behind it. So they stopped me at the casino. So I just stopped. I had to pee anyway, so I just went to the casino. Well, I had to, well, can you imagine if I'd been sitting there having to, have to go to the bathroom? And, Did you uh, play at least? No. Uh -huh. I don't gamble. If I'm going to give money away, I'll give it to, give it to you. I'd rather give it to you than <laughs> you know, give it to those rich guys with the slot machines. I give money away all the time. Pearls uh, probably drinks a little, more, a little more than he should, and when he does, he becomes obnoxious and verbally abusive. Pearls has been married uh, and divorced twice from women who everyone else saw as lovely and caring, but whom he refers to as harridan. Harridan is a word that means a strict bossy or belligerent older woman. Pearls' description of his exes is a case of self-serving bias. To him, they were not very nice people. Everybody else thought that they were lovely, lovely women, but of course, he, had, he divorced them. And potentially, his personality changes when he drinks. Is that a possibility? Or people have the opposite personality when they're drunk? I get depressed. I already told you guys that. And then I get sick. The, I'm not going to play that. This is a song. The great Danish, philo Danish philosopher and theologian Soren Kierkegaard uh, once said, Life is lived forwards, but it's understood backwards. This is one reason why when people are given information, they tend to think that it was knowable all along. And this is, uh, they refer to as common sense. Oh, it's only common sense. Of course, you know what happened, so it seems like it's common sense. This is also known as the I knew it all along phenomenon or hindsight bias. And we do have hindsight bias uh, looking at uh, the football games that uh, now the Super Bowls between the Rams and uh, New England. Uh, if you watched either game, uh, it could have gone either way. I mean, it seemed like a flip of the coin. That's, that's why uh, uh, New England gets to go. They got the ball first, therefore they, got to, they won the game. The United States dominant culture emphasizes uniqueness and individuality. More of the millennial generation says uh, they are unique than previous generations. We saw ourselves as, as, uh, as different before, or as the same. You know, you, you went to Chinle, everybody from Chinle acts one way. We look at somebody from Window Rock, everybody from Window Rock acts a select way. We see them as a group, and everybody acts the same. So you would never date somebody. If you're, a, if you're from Chin Lee, you would never date somebody from Window Rock because they're so much different than you are. Is that the way it works? <laughs> I have no idea what the personalities are. The millennial generation, your generation, this is, this is kind of lovely. These, uh, the, you tend to be more uh, tolerant of others' differences than previous generations. We're seeing uh, changes in the United States that, are, that we, we wouldn't have seen in the past. Uh, transgender, we have ch transgender military personnel. Or we did and, until about two weeks ago, and then the uh, Supreme Court upheld uh, uh, Trump's ban on transgender individuals serving in the service. Um, uh, gays uh, can, live, can, can serve in the, the military as well. Uh, when I was in the service, uh, if you were homosexual, uh, then you had to hide it, uh, because if you didn't hide it, they'd kick you out of the service. And if they found out that you were gay, they would, they would uh, board you out of the service. That's the way it used to be. Now you can marry somebody, and, uh, be, and be in the United States military. Marry somebody of the same gender that you are, the same sex that you are. <clears throat> uh, so your generation sees things differently. Uh, there, uh, when I was growing up, uh, there were two or three African Americans on television. Now there are African American and white people that are married on television. Uh, this is part of, of the uh, texture of, of television now. So your generation is far more liberal than our generation ever was. You're far more tolerant of differences than our generation ever was. Uh, there were never any Hispanics on television. There were never any Asians on television. And now all of a sudden, well, not, it's not all of a sudden, it's been evolutionary, but now we see all kinds of things on television. We see people that are openly gay on television. And of course, in the old days, that wouldn't have happened. 
uh, as long ago as, uh, as George W. Bush, uh, he was elected president on the platform that uh, a marriage should only be between men and women. And of course, that's one of the things that uh, Mike Pence says as well. He's the vice president right now. And he says that marriage should only be between a man and a woman. But of course, the law in the United States says that anybody can marry anybody else. And your generation seems to accept that. And of course, that is because you guys are a lot more tolerant than uh, my generation ever was. Individuals in my generation. There are two key social uh, belief systems. One is individualism and the other is collectivism. Uh, individualism is uh, the concept that you take care of yourself and your immediate family only. That's the only people you have, are responsible to. Um, you pursue your own goals. You don't worry about anybody else. You don't like uh, being influenced by, your, by a group. So it irritates you and that has to do with uh, individualism. Collectivism, on the other hand, uh, you take care of others within your group. So your group is the most important thing. Not your family, not, not you specifically, but it's your group. Group goals are more important than individual goals. Uh, you accept group influence, so if the group thinks you should act a select way, you act that way. Uh, this, if, if you accept a religion, <coughs> uh, religions are collectivistic. You allow other people to tell you how to act. This is the morality I want you to follow. Because you are a member of this church, you have to act this a, a select way. And that's a collectivistic idea. About 70% of the world's population lives in societies with a strong collectivist philosophy. And I, this is the first question, and, and some of you have already answered it. Well, I think Emory is the only one I've graded so far. <laughs> but uh, this, uh, this is kind of an interesting question. Are, uh, is the uh, Diné people, are you guys uh, collectivistic or individualistic? And I thought your, your answer was, was uh, right on, spot on. I know. Just read it. See what it says. The goal of evolutionary psychology is to look for explanations for behavioral universals. This discipline seeks uh, how these behaviors might have enhanced odds of reproductive success. The reality is we act the way that we react. We are animals just like dogs, cats, and anything else. Uh, and because of that, the reproduction is very important. And some of us have reproduced and some of us had, haven't. Uh, but the idea is that we enhance, we dress the way that we dress, we act the way that we act, we uh, uh, do the, the things in our lives uh, for a reason of uh, reproductive success. How about that? So the reason I have this quote on has to do with reproductive success. Well, actually it doesn't. <laughs> it, it doesn't because my the, the person that I would reproduce well was way, 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 way too old to reproduce anyway. <laughs> but the idea is I'm still trying to um, I'm, I'm still trying to be attractive to my wife. So peacock? But sure, I do it all the time. Uh, I dress like this so that uh, it's easier for me to teach. If I dress differently than you guys, then I actually feel different from you. So that's that's kind of. Uh, when I when I worked in the hospital, I always wore a tie, and uh, I was very successful at, at being a, me a medical person. Uh, and the reason I was probably successful was because they felt like I was different, or I, I should be successful because of the clothes that I wore. So we do these kinds of things. If you go to the gym, you're not going to wear what the clothes you've got on right now. You're going to change into exercising clothes that are looser than these, probably because those are your exercising clothes. And you may wear the same exercising clothes every time you go in because you feel like you are able to exercise because of the clothes you've got on. <clears throat> Remember that individuals don't evolve, populations evolve over many generations. So we don't really change. Individuals don't change over time. We can't. We're just one, one cog. But I have a son, and he... The, the difference between the two of us, that is evolution. That's the change that we talk about. Uh, I'm different than my parents. My parents grew up during the Depression. And I'm different from my parents. Now the interesting thing is that some of the food that I eat is very similar to what they ate. They ate because 
That's the food I like. I ate it when I was young, so now I eat it as I am older. Uh, I have a hard time frying my foods in any, anything but bacon grease. I just discovered that. <laughs> I wasn't eating fried potatoes for a really, really long time. And then I started eating fried potatoes and I thought, oh, this is crappy. Then I started eating, uh, frying my potatoes in bacon grease, and now I think it's okay. It tastes better. But the problem is the bacon doesn't have any fat in it anymore, so you don't get a whole lot of fat when you fry your, up your bacon. You get, you get bacon. Anyway, my wife and I were talking about that this weekend. I made her fried potatoes for breakfast. She put some spam in it? I'm a spam. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'll tell you what, when I was in the military, and I was over in Japan, and I was over in Vietnam, and we were over in Korea, everybody ate spam. Everybody ate spam. I, I think spam tastes not not really good. But when I went to Bosch's the other day, here's a display, this huge display of Spam. Thinking, my God, am I in Korea? They eat a lot in Hawaii, too. Oh, Hawaii, yeah, I know the Hawaiians. Yeah, if you want to give somebody something that they like in Hawaii, just give them Spam. They just love Spam. Have you ever tried Mutsubi in Hawaii? It's Spam, but they have um, sushi rice, and then they have seaweed on top. It's See, really I good. I can't eat fish. I can't eat fish, and I don't. No. I won't eat lamb. There's no fish. It's just spam. Oh, it's just spam. Spam, rice, and seaweed. Oh, it's spam. Oh, there's no. I thought you said sushi. I tell you, to stay away from odd things. When I was in Japan, they eat so many strange foods. But you know the flavors. You, you're you're used to the flavors that that uh, that you're that you're used to. So in Japan, they eat a lot of bitter food. So a lot of their meat has vinegar on it. It, uh, it doesn't doesn't taste the same as our meat. Our meat, I don't know what our meat tastes like. I have no idea. A trait that may have been adaptive at one point may persist and become maladaptive as the environment changes. Uh, maybe that's the way uh, you know something has changed in your environment. Uh, arranged marriages, not not nearly as much. Now maybe it's more maladaptive. Uh, these arranged marriages, but then again, maybe we should go back. <laughs> What's the difference between sex and gender? Sex is your biological state of being either male or female. It's your plumbing. It has to do with what you were born with, what parts you were born with. Almost everybody, and the vast majority, 99.9% .9 of people are born as either male or female. Every once in a while we'll find somebody that's born with both, with both parts. But it doesn't happen. Hardly ever happens. It's so rare. It's, I, I know if you look at select sites like everybody's. <laughs> a she-male. But this is really, really, really rare. I know, I, because I've worked in, in medicine, I've watched all these babies being born. I've seen tens of thousands of babies. I've never seen any baby with both parts. I saw an adult with both parts. And I saw it. It was a, he was a military guy. And we did surgery on him. Really? They let him in? Yeah, well, there was no problem. He was his, uh, he was hyper male. It was the weirdest thing in the world. Do I have time? <clears throat> Let me talk about gender, and then, uh, then I'll tell you the story. It's kind of cool. Uh, gender is the psychological state of either being masculine or feminine. Your way of relating to the world, that is your gender. So you can be born one thing and have a gender that is the opposite. And this is what transgender is all about. Yeah, we had this guy... That, they called him Bear because he had so much hair. And he was wounded. He was a pilot. He was a, a marine pilot, asshole. He was the biggest jerk in the world. But uh, uh, so we got him. I was at the right pad at the time. And he was wounded in Vietnam. Uh, they did surgery on him over there. They stabilized him, brought him back to the States. And we were going to do reconstructive surgery on him. Uh, so he had an abdominal wound. He had, he had a leg wound. And so we, when we opened him up to fix him, we found that he had a uterus and he had ovaries. But he also had a testicle and a penis, of course. Uh, his vaginal opening was underneath his, was underneath his testicles. It was really kind of weird. But in order, see, so he's getting pumped with, full of estrogen by his ovaries, but he's also, his, te his testicles are working overtime to keep him masculine. And because of that, because he was pumping out so much testosterone, 
he was he was hairy. He was and he was hypersexual. Oh God, he wouldn't leave the nurses alone. He'd grab them. So they had to assign male nurses to him because he was so bad. Of course, he's also a new pilot. That had something to do with it as well. So they had to decide what they were going to do. And of course, being the military, they wanted to keep him male, of course. Of course. I mean, he was a hyper male already. Uh, but the question was were they going to take out his uterus and ovaries? That was the question. And they debated this for days. They asked everybody in the cousin. I'm surprised the guy didn't find out about it. But they took out his, his ovaries and his uh, uterus. When I was on recruiting duty, we met uh, a person who had both as well. And when we were doing the interview, she, she let us know. So she, she was. Well, she identified as a female. She identified as a female. But she told us during the interview that she had both. And uh, we did never run across that. We had to research what the rules were. And we had to tell her that. Uh, At the time, I guess, <clears throat> you couldn't be transgender. Yeah, so we had to. Uh, let her know the policy, and she had to pick one. And so she actually did. I left for couldn't do later. My friend, my friend, told me that she ended up uh, having the surgery and, and becoming a female. Committing to being a female. Yeah. And they let her. They actually let her. Leave. Well, her gender was already female. Yeah, I, I guess it's logical. That it makes a lot of sense. This guy, they didn't tell. Him. But this was in. Oh, they didn't tell him. They didn't tell him. This is in '72. Oh. Wow. They didn't tell <laughs> They thought it would be psychologically damaging to him. But he, I'm sure he knew. No, he didn't. Well, I mean, he, he didn't have periods. Certainly he didn't have periods. I, I guess he thought everybody had an extra opening underneath their testicles. They know. And it wasn't, it did go in, but it wasn't very functional. He didn't urinate out of it. He urinated out of his penis. Mm. So they did the surgery, but once he finds out how a male and female is supposed to be like, then... This guy was a wild man. I mean, he was beyond anything you can imagine. I don't know if you ever ran into these guys in the military. No, I mean, they gentlemen. Would, would, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> We're all gentlemen. Yeah. I don't know who told you those lies. Uh, exactly. Why don't we stop right here? We'll pick this up next time. <laughs> uh, yeah.